We'll come into the sixth Deep Sound Seminar. I'm Mike Williams. I'm the director of the, the challenge. It's an um, exciting opportunity for us to present some work that uh, has been co-sponsored by Treasury and the Deep South. And it's a bit of a reduction of a presentation that was given as part of the Treasury Guest Lecture Series. So um, yeah, it's an opportunity to share that with, with a wider audience. So thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Um, I'd particularly like to thank those of you who've made uh, the effort to come to one of our physical hubs. Um, it's great that you have um, have that opportunity to interact, not just with the challenge, but with the people around you. Um, I'd particularly like to welcome two new hubs at Waimakariri District Council and Nelson City Council. Thanks for linking in to Deep South. Uh, we're going to have two presentations today because unfortunately one of our original speakers is ill. Uh, with Dave Frame from Victoria University is going to speak first for around about 25 to 30 minutes, and that'll be followed by um, Dave Fleming from Motu. We'll hold all of the questions until after both Dave and David has, have spoken. Um, for those of you who would like to ask questions during the, the presentation, please uh, use the raise hand feature on uh, Zoom. So for those of you who haven't used it before, it's at the bottom of the chat box, so you can um, hopefully find that. For those of you who are in um, hubs with a video conference suite, you'll actually have to get old fashioned and actually stick your hand up. Uh, at the end, when we're going through questions, we'll um, control the microphones and, and um, turn people on and off just to avoid getting feedback. So um, without any further ado, I'll introduce Dave Frame to talk about uh, climate change accounting costs. Dave. Great, um, thanks Mike. Uh, so I'm trying to stay here so you can all hear me. If I start to drift away from the microphone and become um, impossible to hear, then just sing out. I'm sure people will. Um, okay, so this is work that uh, is a real, it's basically a pilot study. Um, we uh, came out of a presentation last year to the New Zealand Planning Institute uh, where I discussed the, the basic technique we're using here the fraction of attributable risk technique. Um, and, uh, and Treasury said they would be interested in a, in a small pilot study, uh, which was $25,000 in about six or seven weeks work. Or, well, it seemed a bit bigger than that, but it's pretty small. So it's a pathfinder study. It's not the final word. Um, it's very far from that. We actually think there's a lot of directions this can be taken in. Um, and we're hoping to follow up on some promising leads on that score um, over the next few months. Um, so what we're basically doing uh, is we're trying to estimate some of the economic costs of climate change. This isn't a full analysis by any means. I'll get to a rounder picture at the end of the talk when I sort of discuss ways forward. But the basic idea is that you can't answer the question, is this event caused by this factor um, and the, the epidemiologists have been, medical professionals have been dealing with this for years. You can't say is this particular lung cancer caused by smoking because there's some probability of getting lung cancer if you don't smoke. But you can answer the question by comparing the incidence of lung cancer in different populations and smoking and non-smoking populations. How much did smoking change the odds of this person getting lung cancer? And so we're using the same basic idea in a climate change context. Uh, we're looking at different sorts of events. In this study, we're looking only at two events. And we chose them because, one, climate models can say something about them that's, that's useful. Um, and secondly, um, because they are, in effect, pretty direct. Their effects on, uh, on economic output um, are quite direct. Um, so they're not mediated through things that have lots of other systems involved, like... Um, uh, they're not ecological systems where there are multiple agents of change, like invasive species and, and things like that. So we chose them partly for the, uh, um, the simplicity of the relationship between climate uh, and the damages. So uh, the, the, the basic idea in the climate change context comes from a paper Miles Allen wrote in 2003. Um, and uh, what you're really trying to do is work out the, the fraction of attributable risk. So that's this change in incidence of this event in a pre-industrial climate versus a modern change climate. Um, and you're trying to say how much the odds of an event like that have changed 
um, times the damages, where those damages directly arise as a result of the weather event, um, and then that gives you the, you know, the costs, uh, the, the attributable costs at the end. So, so we're using climate models to do this, um, and just as a primer for those of you who aren't involved in this sort of work, climate models solve um, uh, atmospheric and oceanic, um, like they solve equations related to the climate system. They're physical models, transport of heat, temperature, conservation of energy, momentum, mass, um, ideal gas law, things like this, equation of state in the ocean. They, they, they solve these equations, or they, they update um, the, uh, the way the climate behaves in response to um, the energy it's receiving. You do this on a computer, they're free running. Um, you are looking at the exchange of uh, atmospheric properties and oceanic properties where you're resolving the ocean. Um, so you look, you've got these little grid boxes and you're looking at the transport of all these different characteristics, moisture, um, uh, pressure, and so on, uh, across between boxes, as well as every so often solving a radiation calculation to look at the, what, the way in which the energy in, the sunlight in, uh, and the energy out, the way the Earth radiates the energy back towards space, are also interacting with the atmosphere. Um, we, there are a whole bunch of different um, sorts of climate models of different complexities. Um, I use some very simple ones, uh, energy balance models and things like that. Um, there are much more complicated ones. In this study, we're using New Zealand, of course, through Deep South, has invested um, in uh, taking one of the very best models and trying to improve its performance in this hemisphere, if you like. Um, what we are... The models we are drawing on in this study are um, uh, a slightly older model, um, which is run many, many times on people's PCs. So this is the Weather at Home experiment, which is a daughter project of the climateprediction.net experiment, where we run um, a Hadley Center model. Um, it's a, still a pretty good model, actually, but it is getting on now. Um, we run it uh, across people's PCs. We farm out jobs. We, it's distributed computing. So you farm out the job, people run it on the PC, they return their results, and that way you can get a larger ensemble by paralyzing the, pro the problem and farming it out than you could running it locally. Excuse me, there are better uses of that local um, process, concentrated processing power on the, on the uh, more um, sophisticated models. We also use the CMIP ensemble, the CMIP 5 ensemble, um, which is the coupled model into comparison project, which is the modeling, um, you run all the, a whole bunch of different quite sophisticated climate models under the same scenarios and you compare the outputs and you get a kind of some measure of model spread or model uncertainty. Model spread is actually a better word, better phrase than model uncertainty. But it's a way of probing the uh, uncertainty in, in our representation <coughs> of model physics. Um, I can answer questions on that if you'd like. So we're using two tools here. Oh, there's hands up. Is that hands up? Okay, don't worry about that. All right, <laughs> don't just keep it. So climate change attribution is really comparing distributions with and without um, human influence. Have those distributions changed? Uh, if they have, how have they changed? And um, how much or what can we attribute to a human influence? Um, so you need to check that your model, you've got to have a reasonable model to do this sort of thing. It's got to simulate the, the events and the conditions um, that you're interested in. Um, it's got to do a reasonable physical job of giving you the causes of that. So if you have the right rainfall, but the rain is for completely the wrong reasons, that's unlikely to give you a really compelling result. But I'll, I'll actually say something in defense of models a little bit later as well. If addressing extremes, it can be very hard to validate extremes because um, they're extreme. You don't have that many observations of them. Um, detection and attribution is something that's been part of the IPCC report um, for the last, since the third assessment report in 2000. And it, um, what it does is it compares uh, the, the pattern of um, climate, surface, in this case it's surface temperature, um, under natural forcings, under uh, human and natural forcings, so that's with the greenhouse and the sulfate forcings on top. And you can see that if the black line is the observations and the um, blue line is the previous generation of climate models, the red line is the current generation of climate models, and the 
yellow bands are the, are the model range within that. So that's the ensemble of different fancy climate models. Um, what you see is that natural forcings don't give you, and that's the observed trend there, natural forcings really don't match the pattern of behavior over the last, since 1950. They don't, and at the global mean level, they certainly don't match at all. Whereas human and natural forcings give you a pretty good um, uh, fit. They pick out broadly the right um, patterns, uh, geographical patterns, and, and pretty much um, the right sort of global mean temperature. So this is, this is where a, a climate model that's forced with a combination of natural and anthropogenic forcings, the actual forcings we observe, as opposed to just the natural forcings, is pretty much the only way of, um, of generating the pattern, the, the four-dimensional pattern, the three, three spatial dimensions and the time dimension pattern of change since 1950. Okay, so this is how we, this is how we, so if we now sort of zoom in on New Zealand and we start thinking about risks, so this is a, a well-established part of climate change science. Um, it's something that it, the IPCC has dedicated a chapter to in the third assessment, fourth assessment, fifth assessment. I can't remember the outline of the sixth assessment, but presumably it'll be in there in some shape or form. Um, the, it's a significant part of modeling globally. Here in New Zealand, there's always been a little bit of activity in it. Sam Dean um, has been involved in this for a while. Um, the Sue Rosia now is involved in this. Um, there may be more people coming in the future, but it's, it's a fairly small niche part of um, climate research in New Zealand, even though it's had a lot of prominence in the IPCC report. And I've repeatedly argued that I think New Zealand under invests in this area, especially given its decision relevance. So what it can tell us about is how Event, how things that are damaging to society or beneficial to society, uh, whoopsie, didn't mean to do that, are uh, changing over time. So what we're doing in this, uh, we don't do, the, do this one in the um, Treasury report, but we do look at droughts and extreme rainfall and we try and say, what can we say from what we've, from the research that's existing, because like I said, Treasury report wasn't all that big, um, about the changes in extreme rainfall and drought in New Zealand between say 2007 and 2017 compared to what you might have had in a pre-industrial climate or even a 1950s climate. Right, so and this, this draws on this idea of probabilistic event attribution. What you have for those is what are called return period diagrams. So your return period here along the bottom, in this case it's 10 years and then 100 out here, it's a log scale, and a linear scale up the side here. Uh, so this is, um, bring my glasses. Autumn runoff, England and Wales, that's a, um, I think the party pool study from many years ago. And what they found was that the pre-industrial climate is more uncertain because we don't have the patterns of sea surface temperature that characterize that pre those pre-industrial climates as well. We didn't, we, we didn't have a surface observational network for the ocean in the 1700s. Whereas we now have very good monitoring and that's why we know a lot more about the modern climate than those pre-industrial climates. So that's why the green bands tend to fan out more than the, um, the blue ensembles. Um, so in this case, what basically happened is that the that events that had been maybe one in uh, 20 years were now becoming more frequent. So they would say a one in eight year event or something like that. Spring flow uh, in parts of the UK, on the other hand, became the, the, the peak spring flow reduced. So you can, all, you can get shifts in both directions, especially with these rainfall precipitation related variables. Temperature tends to pretty much increase everywhere over a long enough baseline. Uh, and, and famously, there was a, a, a probabilistic event, event attribution study which reconciled two apparently contradictory results in the literature um, regarding the Russian heat wave of um, 20, 12 or 13 or something. Basically, there was one study said that event could have happened in a pre-industrial climate, which is true. And another study said that um, though an event like that had become considerably more frequent. Uh, and in fact, that an event of that magnitude probably went from being about a one in 50 year event to being about a one in, uh, sorry, about 
starting off as a one in a hundred year event to being about a one in a fifty year event or something, something like that. You can you can actually see the scale better than I can at the moment. Um, so, so that was a way, probabilistic event attribution is a way of giving a more full picture of the changes in um, events. For New Zealand, um, the, there have been a, a few pieces of work done, but as I say, the investment's small, so we can't do as much as we would like to do in terms of um, looking at these, um, the different extreme rainfall events. So there was a study published in Northland, uh, study on Northland published a couple of years ago, uh, by, led by Sue Rosier, um, and in it, what basically she found was that some of these very wettest events, um, and the, this was the very wet um, July event in 2014, had gone from being about a one in a 350 year event to being about a one in 200 year event. So that's a significant shift in terms of the, the frequency of events like that. There were other regions as well, further back in the return period part of the, um, with higher frequency, character that, that have higher frequencies, where there was also a significant shift between the natural and um, all ensembles. So all means with climate change influences and natural means without. Okay. Uh, there are, of course, biases with these sorts of models. So, um, so here we have, uh, this is the, how the model represents rainfall, because the model, the model boxes are quite broad in the Hadley Centre model. I think they're about 50 kilometres square. So real clouds, real rain can have structures much finer than that, as, it, as pretty much anyone living in New Zealand knows. Um, uh, the, the, and this is the model rainfall and the observational rainfall, and this is just uh, plotting the, um, in effect, the bias between the two. And um, what you find is that the model tends to under simulate the, the rainfall at pretty much all um, rainfall totals. But that's not the sort of bias that you uh, need to get too upset about in the sense that it's pretty clear what you would have to do to, to, to correct for that. So yes, we know, it's a, we know it's a real thing. If you're an engineer and you need absolutely precise numbers, then that is something that you need to do better. And ideally those numbers would all line up along the black line. But, um, but it's also true that it probably is giving you an indicative picture that's, that's fairly reliable and model development would ideally push these black crosses up towards that line. But that's actually probably unlikely to change the large scale picture. And the reason I say that, I'm actually gonna borrow a slide from, this is a, a plot from um, a model run in 1989. So I just want to make a point here about model bias and how it can be a big deal. We just saw that if you need precise numbers, you're not going to get them from, um, from any climate model at the moment. But that doesn't mean they're unusable. This is a plot from a paper by um, Manabe and Stauffer last year, um, or the year before, where they were looking at a model run they did in 1989. So this is years ago. This is the the Paleo Pass, as far as climate modeling is concerned, basically. It was one of the earliest full climate models. Um, and what they did was they looked at um, the, they basically tried to, and, and so the grid boxes there were these big blocks here. Um, so it was very blocky and very primitive by today's standards. But they, but even then, when they forced it with um, greenhouse forcing, they found that the basic shape, and these are observations, by the way, since 19, 50 or 70 or something like that. Um, so this is in effect the transient signal. And then this is what their model did. And you can see that um, even down to the blue bit down here, it doesn't capture by any means perfectly what was going on. But this is a model that's now, what's it, 1989? How old are you if you're born in 30? 30, 30 years? 30 years ago? Um, 30 years of model development has refined this picture. It hasn't totally overturned it. So, what's, so what is happening here is that a model can be seen as a, as a, coherent, a physically coherent way of, of um, giving you an indicative story of what you think will happen if you force a system in this way. And um, I would argue that the state of climate modeling today with the weather at home um, and scenic ensembles is pretty similar it's a lot more sophisticated than this stuff, but 
the general indicative picture it's going to give you is probably a reasonable guide. There may be places and particular situations where your model development suddenly flips something around and heads off in the other direction, but that's probably pretty rare. You can probably make sensible indicative decisions on the basis of the information that's in modern physical models, um, even in the presence of model bias. Though obviously model development is something that's important because ideally we want we need we we would like this these dots these crosses to head up towards that that line. Right. So in the Northland study, I'd better hurry up. I think in the Northland study, we um, uh, there was a, 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 a for the, that particular event, that particular rainfall event. The best guess was that about um, forty-seven percent of that event, um, the risk of an event like that was attributable to attributing that climate change. There was also an uncertainty, which was, you know, fairly, we estimated the uncertainty in this by computing the far over all thresholds corresponding to the uncertainty range in the event. Um, I'll let you read Sue's paper for all that actually, or, or direct any questions on that to Sue, who's in the audience at NEWA, sorry, Sue. Um, so it showed that there was a statistically significant anthropogenic influence on the event um, over much, but not all of the range uncertainty of uncertainty in the event risks of such an event has likely increased. The second set of events we can see, we, we also looked um, at a whole bunch of other extreme rainfall events. We didn't, we weren't able to go through as thoroughly as we were in the Northland case, but we were able to estimate FARS, fraction of attributable risks, for a bunch of thresholds that were relevant to those to each event. Um, so that's how we came up with a bunch of numbers for the the extreme rainfall. We also um, estimated using self-organizing maps and the SEMIP ensemble, um, the, the effects of two droughts, uh, 27, eight and 2012, 13. Um, the first of which cost two and a half billion dollars according to a treasury estimate. The second of which cost one and a half billion. Um, and again, we, we it, it sort of depends how you cut it, which is what partly what the abstract book tells you here. Um, exactly how you define the drought, which drought index you use, because droughts are, you can measure droughts in different ways and characterize them in different ways. But the odds are that the, that we think the odds are that the um, odds of an event like those had gone up by, the, by between 20 and 40% roughly um, on, a, on a reference climate. So droughts are probably also more likely than they had been. For the purposes of the, of the uh, treasury table, we actually, one of those droughts was contaminated by an ENSO signal. Um, and so we backed off a little and actually reduced the, our fraction of attributable risk, risk estimate here back to 0.15. But the basic thing here is that these, so we use, um, we actually compared apples and oranges here a bit. We used insurance council estimates of the insured losses of the flooding events the rainfall events, and we use Treasury's economic analysis, analyses of the economic costs, which are not the same. So insurance losses are not, do not capture all the economic costs of an event, right? So um, sitting in traffic for hours because somebody's having to rebuild your bridge is not, ought to be captured in a full economic calculation, probably isn't actually, but it probably should be, um, but in a flooding, in an insured loss sense, it won't be. A shop being shut for weeks while it's being rebuilt and the opportunity cost of that shop being shut is captured in an economic costing, but not captured by an insurance estimate. So, so these, and according to Elan, um, uh, he, Elan Noy reckoned that some of these, um, the insured losses can be as low as a tenth of the full costs of, um, of a flooding for a flood for, for one of these sorts of events. So even if, you know, that, that would significantly bump this up. And one of the things I've got actually that we're finalizing in the report is some comments from Ilan and Adolf Strindberg. And um, because Treasury are quite happy with the science here, they felt the economics needed a little bit, a little bit more attention. So we've, we've tried to go and do that. But the basic point is even, even without factoring in the way that insured losses alone underestimate economic damage, we still ended up with a number around 840 million over 10 years. So, uh, which is, which is, you could say is a small number or a large number, depending on what you're comparing it to. But that's, that's where we're at. Um, we will go back and think about the comments we've had. 
Um, so now that's that's kind of where we got to. The very final thing I want to say is um, we have some uh, models can do different sorts of events. We, temperature is probably pretty reasonable in general for New Zealand. Precipitation is harder than temperature, but still useful. It contains biases, but probably gives strong and definitive results. A multi-study approach would be ideal. So in an ideal world, you'd have something like weather at home to give you the, the tails of the distribution, those extreme events, extreme, um, uh, yeah, one in a thousand kind of year realizations. The scene of ensemble to give you some measure of model spread and some really fancy high resolution stuff for some specific detailed studies. And there's a range of other events we'd like to get to. Tornadoes are really, you know, it's just way subgrid scale, you can't get anywhere near it. Cyclones, well, you know, um, maybe one day things are improving, models are getting better at the tropics. Um, Sue and Jim and I, James Greenwick and I have talked about some quite, we think, really cool ideas about things we could do there. Um, so there's, you know, we'd like to, we'd like to do more, but um, this research, I think, um, we probably do need to um, expand capability in order to get anywhere near that. Um, ideally, we would like to, um, uh, to uh, this was from a CCRI, CCII report, I think, the climate change impacts and implications. Ideally, we'd like to be able to look at all the ways in which different systems, um, these are climate impacts via temperature and drought, um, climate impacts via rainfall intensity changes. We'd like to look at other systems, systems that are um, uh, related to these things. So here's a, um, with the temperatures, changes in species limits, impacts on pollination, that's on the biological side, increased fire risk, um, some pretty specific stuff here like merino wool quality. Um, uh, and then rainfall, likewise, we'd like to look out different set into different knock-on implications. Those would require totally different skill sets from the meteorological skill sets we've got and trained so far. We'd like to expand the meteorological side. We also think there's, there's downstream, having done that, there's possibilities to look at broader impacts. But I think the, a mistake would be to look at all those broader impacts without looking as well at the, that developing that meteorological capability so that you're getting the, the right inputs in the first place. And that's where I'll stop. Thanks, Dave. Um, great. As I said at the beginning, we'll just hold off on questions for Dave until the end. Um, so I'll just introduce our next speaker, Dave Fleming from my turn. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll just take my time here. So we have 15 minutes or less? Okay. Alrighty. Um, well, I'm David Fleming, happy to be here. I am a fellow with MOTU, and we have been doing, doing this work with uh, Sally Owen, which is an RA in MOTU, and Illinois, as you probably all of you know, in Victoria University, and one of his students, Jacob Pastor, Pastor Pass, actually. Um, so, short acknowledgements, of course, this has been funded by the Deep South Challenge, um, Science Challenge, so, I mean, we're grateful about that, for, from, from the funding, but also, Special thanks to the EQC because they were very kind to provide the data that we are using for this project. And also to NIWA because uh, the guys shared the precipitation data that we are going to be using too. So just a very quick background. I mean, we are all familiar with the topic, but um, when we sat with, with Ilan thinking about a proposal to put the Deep South Challenge, of course, we were thinking about the increasing increase in likelihood of have more extreme events happening in New Zealand due to climate change. So, and of course, there's a lot of discussion in terms of what, what we should do about that because people tend to start populating even more the coast there, it's just expanding, so people try to, at the end, um, the exposure of communities to natural hazards, to extreme events actually is kind of increasing given the compounding effect. So we were thinking on uh, what is, that we should be looking at. And of course, what is a very important thing to start discussing is to look at historic data to what has been happening uh, in the past. So to do that, uh, looking at different data sources, we found that the EQC actually uh, collects claims, all information of their claims that they receive. Um, and the data is very good. And, and the good thing is that uh, the EQC covers um, damages, not just to earthquakes, but also they have 
a special component that, that covers actually damages after a weather events, which, um, which are claims related to landslips, storms, and floods. So given that the EQC, we can use that data, we set up three different objectives. And the main first objective is to look at this past historic trend on how the different claims have been happening across the country. Uh, which the EQC has been recording. So we got that data from EQC and we just um, kind of were finishing the step on analyzing very in detail how claims are shaping across space and over time. And with that data too, we have two more objectives in the project. One is kind of try to understand better if the EQC has meant any sort of recovery for communities that have been affected by particular disasters. And the third component is try to propose a, a, a sort of potential liability for the EQC in the future of different climate change scenarios. So, as I mentioned, the EQC, eh, as you probably all of you know about, um, is a public insurance system that is, was actually created to cover uh, damages coming from earthquakes in New Zealand. But the EQC, as I said, also covers some damages related to weather events. And that's actually the data that we're using, and those are related especially for claims uh, coming after storm floods or landscapes. Must be important to say that EQC doesn't cover every sort of type of damages coming after these events. It's, it doesn't work like a private insurance for, for damages in properties, especially after some storms or floods. So the system that what the, the EQC covers and what it doesn't cover is a bit complicated. So I'm not going to go in detail to that in the, in the presentation, but it's very well documented in the EQC webpage. But important to say that, I mean, most of the cover that, that they, 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 they provide is going to damages happening into the land of properties, especially after storms and floods. But in the case of landscapes after weather events, that is important because not landscapes after earthquakes, but only after weather events, they also do some covering on damages to building and content. So given that, um, here are these initial numbers of what we have from the EQC data. So the EQC data, we have reliable observations since year 2000, when they started recording everything electronically. So since then, um, the recording of all the information across from claims is very uh, consistent. Um, we are using practically, our observations are coming from 2000 to uh, October to last year. So in that period, um, we have more than 26,000 observations. Uh, of which, unfortunately, there are um, some that don't have a georeference very well recorded. So we are missing kind of um, a, a, a quite kind of around 11,000 observations uh, that didn't have proper location data. But anyways, close to 19,000 observations where we do have uh, observation data so we can track claims across space. Especially. Some of them were not closed, given that we were using in that till October of 2017. So of course, that uh, claims that were coming late in 2017 were not yet closed, but we are using anyway because some of them had some payments attached to them. So we can get like the overall figure in terms of payments. And as you can see here in this part in the middle of the table, I we just put the aggregated numbers on the total amount that you see has paid since 2000 to October 2017 on the different type of damages that manages to land, to build it, and content. And this sum is around 290 million dollars adjusted by inflation and GST, that's important to observe too, um, since 2000, which is a quite significant number. Uh, it's, of course, it's a very small number if you look at the EQC in total and the coverage that they do after earthquake, especially after the Canterbury earthquake. But it's still, we're talking about more than 25,000 claims coming to the EQC just because of weather events and around $300 million in just in payments. So it's still it's a very significant number for the EQC. And then at the bottom here, I just put the, 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 the numbers in general. So at the end, uh, we have a lot of claims also that report zero payout, which uh, in the paper we are describing that more in detail, um, but generally are related to claims that were like claims coming uh, repeated in the same event. So they were originally covered for the original claim. Or it's also because coming from households that don't have private insurance, because at the end, the AQC provides coverage, coverage only from households that do have private insurance, too. And in our sample, 15% of the households didn't record a private insurance, which is a little above probably the average in New Zealand, because I think the average for New Zealand for private insurance is around 90%. Um, in our case, we have around 85, 86% of properties were covered. So all those. Properties that didn't have private insurance actually received zero payout from the EQC because 
they weren't technically covered by the QC. But even considering that, when you, we exclude all the zeros in, in our observations, we have around 15,000 claims, and the average claim is, was $19,000. So still important numbers. And these are just plots showing uh, the trend of, of, of the claims over the years. Uh, this first plot is just, this chart is just number, the number of claims happening across years since the years 2000. Um, and the, the chart in the middle is just showing the total payouts that the AQC has been doing over the years also, uh, adjusted again by inflation and GST. And this bottom chart is related to what David was talking about, about this data coming from the insurance, uh, private insurance companies, uh, from the insurance council, where they do provide aggregated numbers at level of natural disasters, right? The, the total figures that they were paid by private insurances. And we just put this uh, across different years. Uh, important something to probably to highlight in the first one is that it could be argued there that in as kind of a, positive trend, it's kind of a positive uh, slope in terms of the number of claims over years. It's not that clear actually with the data, but if you can say, for instance, this valley here between 2012 and 2016 is, 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 is higher, right, in terms of number of claims received than the early 2000. So in some sense, we can say that over time, there are probably more claims coming on. 2017 is particularly interesting because at the end, it was a year very, well, as we know, we have very, very different extreme weather events in New Zealand. But just up to October, it was ranking very high. So at the end, the following number, I think by December, is very close actually to 2004 and 2011. In terms of payouts, again, 2017 here is not fully reflected yet, the total amounts paid, because we are using just data till October. And there are a lot of payouts were made and are still probably being paid until now. So still, it's not conclusive, and we cannot just argue that we have a positive trend, right? It's kind of there, but it's something that we need to be cautious about, at least from the year 2000 to now. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think we, have, we can make a concluding remark about this. Um, that's about the total numbers over the years in terms of um, payouts and number of times received. And this is just showing a more detailed analysis show, uh, of the different payouts um, of their particular events across, uh, across the country. And you can see there are five distinctive peaks, and those are related to five part particular uh, disaster events, right? And the, the ones in 2011 uh, were three different, actually, big events that happened and had nothing to do with the country earthquake, but they are totally related to weather events. Um, so that's kind of showing that actually 2011 was a very hard year for the APC because plus all the costs that they had to cover after the earthquakes, they did have also all these damages coming from, from extreme weather events in 2011. But it's particularly interesting, for instance, what we're finding here is that the flooding in the Bay of Plenty and Waikato has been the largest single event producing most damages in the country, at least from the, from the point of view of the APC, I mean, at least from the liabilities that APC had to cover where they have more than $20 million, this is, this is around $20 million, just in payouts made by the, by, the, by the QC in 2005. We then in the paper also are showing this table, which what we're doing is just ranking the different events based on the total amounts paid by ADQC in terms of um, the regated amount at the, at the event level. And again, the Bay of Plenty and the White Cattle flooding in 2005 is ranking first uh, and, and actually very far away from the second place uh, and, the, and the rest, uh, showing that particular uh, damages that this thing produces, especially the floating part, because of the worst, most of these claims are coming from land damages. And as you can see, most of the damages here too, I mean, let me see the, I have the map here. Yeah, I wanna just jump to the map a little bit. Um, this is the distribution of claims across the country. And of course, it's interesting to see how much of the concentrations are happening in the cities, which is kind of obvious because it's where most, most people are located, in, in Auckland, Wellington, uh, Christchurch, especially. Um, it's the highest concentration of people. Of course, there are going to be more claims coming from them. But also, it's interesting to see these areas so of this Nelson and Tasman Bay area here in the South Island, and all what is the Bay of Plenty in the North Island. 
which are actually the regions more exposed to, to, to the Pacific storms, and are actually reflected that very well in the EQC data because high, most, most of, the, of the damages are coming from those regions. Let me just get back to this table the dam uh, on the disasters. And as you can see here, actually the top five disasters that we have in the table for, again, for coming from the EQC liabilities actually are located in those regions. In the table here, we're also presenting five, okay. We are also linking uh, this data to the NIWAS weather catalog, which is a very interesting web uh, tool, guys, that you have there because it's very good information. So we just went one by one, just checking what the uh, weather catalog had to say about the different particular disasters. Um, and in some cases, even if these numbers, especially the numbers coming from the insurance councils is reported in the event in the weather catalog. Not always, but in many cases. But we are providing these links to here in the paper. Uh, and here also in this table, we are just contrasting numbers to what the private insurance is paid. And it's interesting to see because at the end, what the private insurance pay doesn't correlate much with what the EQC family is paying. And that's why, because the, the private insurance actually, they, they do have a lot more coverage and they do pay a lot more on, on damages and the coverage uh, to properties. And, um, but, and the by the EQC is mainly narrowed, the coverage they have is much more narrow than they mainly cover damages to land. For instance, we can say here that the largest highest event in terms of payout from private insurances uh, since 2000 was the uh, big uh, heavy rain that happened in the North Island in 2004. While for the EQC, this doesn't mean, this didn't mean much damages because probably there was not much flooding damage happening here. Differently from here, right, when we have especially a floating event where the EQC was much more uh, liable in, in, in paying damages than the private insurance itself. So this is just a seasonal pattern, just showing that there is a clear seasonal pattern uh, as expected that with the concentration of claims coming in the winter months and a little bit more also in the summer months. That's not that interesting, but it's just nice to show. Then we also look at all the claims coming from different regions. And again, this uh, kind of interesting numbers here to look at. Um, and again, the Northland and, and the Bay of Plenty, I, I didn't highlight the Bay of Plenty here, but are the, especially when we look at the average uh, claims payout per person, per people, the uh, Northland actually claims coming from Northland have received a lot more payouts at the end, along with Nelson and Tasman. So these are the regions practically where the EQC actually is, 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 is having more, a, 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 a higher role to play than the rest of the country. So Nelson and Tasman, they also, especially the Nelson region, it's kind of interesting to see how on average, when we look at the average payout per number of properties, actually the Nelson case is quite remarkable because it's, it's kind of three times higher in terms of kind of payout of DQC than the rest than the second one that is in Northland. But interesting enough from all the description that we're doing here in the paper about claims of, uh, in terms of people, in terms of property across regions, the highest average payout in, for claims actually coming from this form, uh, which is not necessarily uh, highlighted in the map in terms of a uh, highly exposed area for natural disasters, but at the end in terms of totally amounts paid by, by, by claim, uh, this one actually is the one leading for far the rest of the country. Then we got all the claims data, we start doing some analysis, some comparative statistics to, to see what is interesting actually from data. And um, what we're doing here is just we got all the properties. We, we link, of course, all the claims to, Q, to CoreLogic property data, to the QB data. Uh, so we can contrast uh, claims to the rest of the properties in the country. And what we did here is just looking at the average instance, for instance, of the whole properties in the country based on the QB data. We have over 1.6 million properties in New Zealand. And we contrasted. This is the main distance and the median distance from the property to the coastline, especially to, to, to the coastline. And we look here and it's interesting just to see how big difference is in the mean and in the median between properties that didn't have a claim to the EQC over time to properties that have put claims to the EQC since the year 2000. And it's interesting to see how much closer to the ocean actually are all these properties putting claims to the EQC which probably sounds like obvious and something that expected, but at the end is 
it's, it's very important to see it in the data and prove empirically, uh, showing that actually houses that are much closer to the coast are way more exposed and then at the end are more, uh, they mean higher liability in overall for DQC, which I think for the government and for DQC is important information to have because at the end it's kind of saying, here are actually the properties that are causing us more, more costs over time. Um, and then we look also at the, where the, com the, the AQC is coming in terms of um, mesh locks. So we, we plotted and we tried different uh, socioeconomic um, characteristics of the mesh locks from when the claims are coming. And interestingly, also we found that most of the AQC claims are coming, I'm gonna just keep this, this, this table I'm showing in the graph. So the red line here are mesh loads from where the AQC claims are coming, com contrasted to the blue line there is the average mesh load in the country. And it's interesting to see how um, this is a part of the median income, the personal median income of the mesh load. So it's in interesting to see how at the end, mesh loads from where claims are coming have a higher, um, a, a, a statistically significant, significantly higher actually median income than the average of the average of the country. We looked more that in further and we did an analysis by quantiles and we just divided all mesh blocks of the country by income quantiles. And we are finding a circle there in the, in the red line and that actually there is a lot more proper claims and final payouts happening in the top tiers, the, the top two tiers quantile of mesh blocks, kind of implying that actually at the end, most of the EQC coverage and payments are happening in mesh blocks that have higher personal income on, on higher income measures. And just to finish, I'm over time, uh, just to highlight some future steps in this project. The first one is we have practically done the first paper with the political politics, one subsection of it, and we'll hopefully we'll be circulating that for peer review soon, so we have it publicly available by the end of the month, that's the idea. And then to start looking on the other two components of the project, which is, um, analyze the role of claims for the recovery of communities and a discussion on if any type of increasing financial liability to the AQC. And that will be over time. Thanks. Thank you very much, David and Dave. Do you want to just both sort of hang around at the front um, and we're going to open up the floor for questions. It could be from this room, raise your hand, from any other hub, raise your hand, or um, virtually to Alex. And Alex is going to try and do them in order and make it fair. So you can ask questions um, from Dave's presentation about the work that he did with Treasury or David's um, analysis of the EQC data. Can somebody, oh that's you. Do I get rid of it? Who's that? What does it say? Judy Lawrence. And what does it say? Is the costing methodology that Treasury used available? Yes. Um, yeah. We link to it in the report. Um, so when the report's out, it'll have Treasury have a couple of. Um, they had a little working paper or two on this. Um, they basically hired a consultant, I think, to look at that stuff. But yes, is the answer. Is there another one? Oh, sorry. Psychophysics? Oh, okay. Uh, well, I had a question to David. Um, so you mentioned that, um, was it Bad Plenty and the Waikato had one of the highest amounts of claims? What sorts of claims were they in general? And then you had to categorize them. Go through the individual claims. No, but what do you mean? I mean, because the category is all coming from damages, the, the you can see have an overall category of landslips, storms, and floods. Yeah, so they so don't distinguish. You said, you said at the beginning of your presentation that it was mostly claims, they paid out mostly claims on land. 
Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mostly like agricultural ah. from farm claims for losses to farm. That kind of. Yeah, we haven't looked in detail that, but you can. We, I mean, the data allows you to go in detail and actually to look at you know, pay up like two claims. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm, my, my guess is that most of that is coming from land damages. And the dam land damages at properties actually is, is covered. It's typically it's a bit complicated how the QC provide all this cover. But to my understanding, they don't cover agricultural land at all. It's just the property land where the residence, where the property is located. The, 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 one of the interesting things that both presentations effectively get at is this um, vulnerability of areas that are um, open to the north, to these atmospheric river events, where you get you get especially filaments off tropical cyclones or other um, tropical precip activity that just come hammering in, and they just come they come straight in and um, they dump a lot of water really fast. So Nelson, the Nelson area again had some last month. I was over there at my dad's a couple of days ago, and um, they had 550 mils in the month. In fact, in about a week. And it's normally about 150 over the month. So it was just a phenomenal amount of rain. And, and those areas that are open to those rivers, one of the things we want to understand better is that behavior of those rivers. And this is quite potentially quite cool science, I think, um, linking this stuff to that um, emergence of climate change literature, which sees the tropics in a relative sense move faster. So there's more, more to be done there. But you also expect a lot of damage on the West Coast in the winter as the westerlies intensify. But and while you see that, in, I gather, in infrastructure damages, you don't necessarily see any QC claims because there's not as much residential property. Right. We've got two questions. Oh, great. Um, so, Greg Bonin is asking, Dave, how are you going to deal with the problem? It is difficult to tell. I think, I think it's. Um, might have to defer to Sue on this, but I think basically the the two thousands. I wouldn't expect a significant two thousand and five to two thousand and fifteen trend because of natural variability, and also in fact the you, you might get it the next decade because the, if the hiatus it was a sort of flat pause between the two late two between the two thousands and the mid two thousands and tens, so there wasn't a lot of um, globally. Uh, warming over that particular period. So you, you're probably not going to find a big trend over that period, but uh, it's also very short compared to the forcing timescales. But it's a good, it's a good question. It'd be nice, it'd be interesting to look at. Um, the chat box. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so there's a question from Jet. So for people that didn't hear the previous question, um, Greg Bodecker was asking if there was a trend toward an increasing percentage of attribution for more recent events. Mm -hmm. That's what Dave just answered. The next question is from James Hughes. Is there any information on losses to council assets, for example, from the LAPP fund or private insurers? Mm. Have you looked at it? I don't know. No. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. this is a pretty small scale operation at this point. I think both, both what David and Elan and Belinda are doing and what we're doing. So we, we've sort of started at pretty aggregate assets, levels and haven't, haven't really gone, been able to break it down. Sec Another question we've had, I think it was Greg, uh, in fact, um, asked about sectoral breakdowns uh, in another talk. Um, so that's another place, oh, yeah, that's another place we could potentially go, mm -hmm. I think. There's a, there's a range of ways we could take this research. Yeah, no, hi Catherine. Do you want to come up to the front because other people in the other hubs can't hear the questions? <laughs> and I don't, I could maybe turn the microphone on, but you can just pop up here. Okay. Right. Thanks, Catherine. Um, uh, hi, uh, thanks, uh, both Dave's, right? Um, I was very interested by the comments from Dave Frame. Uh, in, I mean, almost in comparing the information um, about the different types of events, like you had the droughts and extreme weather events and sea level rise, well, that almost didn't matter because it was such a long term and one that was of more consequence in economically in the short term, the droughts mm -hmm. and extreme weather events. And I'm thinking that we've got all these projects on sea level rise and there's a huge amount of effort into that, and certainly that's captured the public attention. 
Yeah, and, so, and I just wonder whether you could comment on that. Yeah. Should, you know, what are some yeah. policy implications? So, what's so funding? What are some questions, things you think we should do? Sure. I think it's a... Um, uh, sea level rise will matter. Um, in the near term, storm surge, which goes with often actually um, storms from the south as well. Um, here, certainly we're vulnerable mainly to storm surge from the south on the south coast rather than the northerly type events. Um, storm surge is one of the main ways that, main things that drives current coastal inundation. Thermal expansion is, um, and to some extent, land glacier melt are the things that govern most of the sea level rise this century. Later, Greenland and um, the Antarctic will come, come on stream, but I think it's a, it's a peculiar set of priorities to start with the stuff that matters furthest away. And the, the economically at Treasury, I argued that we were we really under investment, invested in these nearer term risks that are actually the ones that are driving these payouts now. So that, that's a research gap. And I think mm -hmm. it's a case where the scientific capability into looking at long term sea level rise has rather led the agenda rather than social need or actual current, um, you know, uh, like what's going on now. And that's where I think there's beginning, there's the beginnings of an acceptance of that. Um, ideally, we'd like to look at the relationship between attributable storms and coastal inundation in a time series kind of way. Um, so look at that across time. Thanks, Dave. Um, we've got three more questions. We might just have time to get through them. So Carl Bayliss is asking you, David, I think, about your third objective. Can you comment on the long-term sustainability of the EQC? <laughs> Well, probably we can comment that when we're done doing that research. But uh, the idea is to look at, I mean, given these trends that we are looking at the AQC claims, and the idea now is to try to to um, to understand better how these EQC are related to historic trend, uh, historic precipitation data that we got from NIWA. We are doing that, that that analysis now, and then we have all the also the projection on precipitation also coming from NIWA. And ideally, the, the idea of the project is to look at both data sets and try to understand if the, the kind of among the correlation that we're observing now of DQC related to precipitation and then looking at the, the, the forecast, the, the projected precipitation data to see if we can infer any potential future liabilities for DQC. That's kind of more, of, more or less the overall objective of the part of the comp component of the project. But we still need to do that analysis as well. Okay. And I, not sure, you mentioned that about Elan, I'm not quite sure. So Judy Lawrence is asking, has Elan documented the heuristic of one-tenth the full cost of the insurance claims and uh, what is the I, basis of this? Look, I, that's something he said to me in passing at Treasury. I need to follow up on um, references and things like that, but it's, um, uh, we need to get, you know, we, before we finalize the report, <laughs> we need to get a bit more, he's out of the country at the moment, I think, but we need to find out what to say that's sensible about that stuff. The, the other point I was just going to make, just before that question, is the sea level rise one is also, I think the risks of ta starting talking about sea level rise is it's going to be politically one of the hardest bits of adaptation because of the, um, the particular nature of that public good. Um, some of these insurance questions or um, social insurance questions, I think are probably slightly easier. Um, and I would prefer to climb small mountains early rather than Big mountains later, so we'll leave the big mountains for later once we've got an established plan. So I think there's two ways in which we're not starting in the right place. Okay, so final question from um, someone at the University of Otago. Have you noticed any trends in people's readiness to insure or not? And could that be taken into account in the analysis? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, the quick question is no, but we are doing a particular a couple of case studies looking at more in detail the QC claim data specifically. For instance, the case of Nelson, again, it's very interesting because it's one of the most exposed regions, right, to, to, to all the storms coming from the Pacific. Um, but there still is a region lodging the most, the most number of claims and the highest payouts for the QC even. I mean, still, right, even though Nelson has been there for how long? Yeah, yeah, century? For a long time. And so now Jacob, an uh, student, uh, student, is doing a much more detailed analysis of Nelson case. So it he also has a heavily that. primary economy base as well, so that, that might be a, a factor. No, I suppose no more than most of rural New Zealand. But 
the, the thing that Belinda might say if she were here is that it may, may be the case that the insurance company's response outpaces private response to some extent, and that if mm. you get you get changes in return periods such that a flooding event becomes more common than say one in 20 years, if it's currently one in 50 and it moves to one in 20, there's a significant possibility that some, at least some insurers will um, retreat in terms of their coverage and actually step away from, from co offering cover to those properties. And then that's a really interesting policy question as to what happens next, like do they do they, does that mean that person just can't live there anymore? Does that mean the, count, the, the councils or the public are asked to pay? How will the politics of that shake down? And I think, I think those questions coming at us pretty quickly and they'll be miniature models of the sea level rise problem, which will be a bigger problem down the track. But, but there are real issues coming at us because of these changes in return periods. Um, and, and I know in the Northern Hemisphere in Europe, where the re reinsurance sector is really based They've been thinking about this for about 15 years. Um, and I was really stunned when I first came to New Zealand that nobody in the insurance sector seemed particularly uh, up with the play. Um, and that's because we're two steps away from there. We have, we are mostly integrated into an Australian market where they're thinking about the bigger questions and then they in turn into American or European reinsurance markets. So, but I think what we're seeing is that the level of change uh, and certainly the scale of claims is big enough that actually New Zealand's had to move forward because these changes coming out of the north which is what what david's showing and to some extent what sue's showing um are rapid enough and extensive enough that they are as belinda would say threatening to affect your insurance in a pretty real time okay. sense okay our time's up so thank you very much to both of you for great presentations thank you very much to everyone who attended and um we are lining up the next Deep South Challenge Seminar, which um, should be um, one from our Vision Mataranga program, Sean Awatere, and we will share information about that shortly. It will be in about five or six weeks' time. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks.